So we are now live on YouTube. It is Friday, April 23rd, 2021. And we are taking up an amendment to S-145 that is being offered by Senator Rahm. And the amendment is 145. J.R.T.J. Um, I'm sorry, it's being taken, is being offered by Senator Vaughn, and I'm going to let her explain the amendment, and then we're going to hear from uh, John Campbell, I think Julio uh, Thompson, and um, Mike Sherwin. Okay. Um, Senator Rom, do you want me to make you the co-host to share? Um, I, I think well, actually, Bryn, yeah. couldn't Bryn share it? Sure. Bryn, you're the co-host. She drafted it. So. Yes. I don't need that kind of responsibility in my life. <laughs> um, just just sort of here to give a, a conceptual overview. And you know, I really appreciate Bryn's help and work on this as judiciary is not my sort of native land here. Um, but as I was listening to the debate and discussion yesterday around H145, in kind of marquee lights, I was just seeing credibility as a big concern underlying um, the culture that you are trying to create with this bill of accountability around what is reasonable use of force for a police officer. Um, you know, you raised the uh, murder of George Floyd as an example of why language like this would be helpful and important. And as you may have seen, the first report out of the police department was calling three officers standing on someone's back and including his airway, um, a medical incident. Um, in the case of Adam Toledo, uh, you know, there, the first reports before the body cam footage came out were around him having a gun in his hand. Um, you know, so Dante Wright, I meant to reach for my for my taser, and instead I reached for my gun. Um, we have a, a question, I think, in this country and in this state around what an officer testifies to have happening in an incident, um, you know, versus what we end up seeing and invest and investigating around body cam footage and other evidence that we may have. Um, as you may also be aware, there was a recent Human Rights Commission case involving Clemens Family Farm. Um, you know, where there were concerning allegations that a trooper was coaching um, essentially someone squatting on their land and that was caught on dash cam footage and other video footage. And so, you know, when I heard um, the discussion, it occurred to me that I had been working on language with Bryn around uh, Giglio files and the um, ways that we have currently in statute to try and hold officers accountable to accurate and um, accurately represented information about incidents. Um, what I have heard from several states attorneys who actually were the ones to raise this with me is that there are agencies and local law enforcement departments that um, perceive in some way that this is somehow discretionary for states attorneys to be adding information about falsified or misclassified information to someone's um, you know, disclosures or Giglio files. And as you probably know, um, this has a lot to do with their credibility to take the stand in a court case, um, including their ability to be a um, uh, investigator on the scene of a crime for murders, et cetera. And that's, should, we should take that very seriously um, you know, their, their ability to be a credible witness on the stand. And if they've had those kinds of um, inaccuracies before in the information that they've presented. And so what this does, I think, is clarify um, that it is not discretionary for a state's attorney to disclose this information, um, that, you know, they have a responsibility to disclose this information and to have it on file. Um, and so, you know, you'll hear more from Bryn about the ways that that would need to be embedded in statute in order for that to be the case. But I did have state's attorneys say they welcomed this change because it would stop law enforcement from um, in some way making it, it, losing trust with law enforcement because law enforcement is seeing it as some something they would have discretion over and that it should be clearer that they 
this is their duty as a state's attorney um, and anyone on the on the in this you know defending the state and the state's interests that they have this information available. Um, I think what you may hear, I did talk to the attorney general this morning, um, and you may hear that it's in the interest of the attorney general's office to try and at some point have this information in a more public repository or some kind of central location, which I think would be a logical next step. But what I'm asking for today is that we clarify that this is a non-discretionary piece of our justice system that we know about officer misconduct and the misclassification or misrepresentation of information before we're giving them the benefit of the doubt about what level of reasonable force they used in a situation. Dick, you're muted. That was great. I was telling Senator White, she's muted. <laughs> and I was muted. A great Zoom. I love it. So Senator I, White. I finally got hooked up. I'm not sure why it's echoing. Do you have another device going, Jeanette? I thought I actually you're on you you've got the other device you're on twice Senator White oh I thought I went off on that one no it's still on I think that's why you're mute why would it still be on I do you want me I to try know. and remove it I can try yeah. to remove the blank Senator White and leave us yes. with the real Senator White <laughs> okay that's, that's the evil that's Senator works. White and the good Senator. Okay, you did there it Peggy great job <laughs> thank you Peggy's so, going to go to work for IT next week. Keisha, I, I apologize for, I just, I am having uh, device issues this morning, but so I, I missed the part and I did read it last night, but it was, um, the language was a little too legalese for me. So I, I appreciate your explanation. Um, is, is there a difference between, um, uh, purposeful misrepresentation and just um, reporting something that in the moment seemed one way and wasn't another way. <coughs> I mean, is there a difference between kind of purposeful and just making a mistake? Um, I, I think it's a good question for the state's attorneys. I only have examples, um, you know, and it would still rely on the corroboration or the sort of clarification from probably other witnesses or officers. One example, you know, was saying that someone was slammed to the ground, but, but had their hands free, were not handcuffed, when in fact they were handcuffed, which is a very different situation. So the, the examples that I've heard are pretty um, sort of clear one, one way or another. Um, and I, you know, so I, I think there's probably some level of discretion that will always exist for a state's attorney to say they, they seem to be knowingly misrepres misrepresenting the information or not. But um, the examples I've heard are, are, are pretty clear. And if you, know, uh, you have, say, an officer say, I, I shot them because you know, they had a gun in their hand and then there's clear body cam footage that they did not have a gun in their hand, you know, I think that's still information that the public mm -hmm. should know regardless of, you know, whether or not they knowingly <clears throat> believed that, if they thought they saw a gun in someone's hand, um, you know, I think that's still valuable information for everyone to have and not just take the word of, of the officer. I, I don't know if we're at the point, you, you all would know better if, if we have body cam footage from every incident in the state, um, but to the extent that we do not, you know, we still should allow the public to know information about an officer's history of misclassifying information um, to be able to access justice. So, forgive me, now, reading the Digger article, Tarnished Badge, um, I thought that it was clear there are certain officers who state's attorneys just won't call as witnesses because they're not um, credible where they've been proven to not be credible and often wondered how they could stay on the job. And Senator, the other bill last year, a companion to, one, to this bill, 145, was the, um, I can't remember the number, it came out of Senator White's committee. It was more on the uh, declassification, I mean, decertification, other 
measures that can be taken to what law enforcement bring. Can you explain the difference between what this does and those officers who are no longer credible to testify on bills? I'm sure that, um, and doesn't they, uh, don't, don't the, doesn't the state already have an obligation to give every informa all information to the defense? Um, so to answer your first question, for the record, Bryn Hare from Legislative Council, um, to answer your first question, um, I'm not sure I can answer it actually, because I didn't, I didn't work on that bill in Senator White's committee. Um, but I, I can tell you that um, there is existing common law that requires that the prosecution turn over um, certain types of evidence to the defense. And that includes what was commonly called as Brady material and Giglio material. And the idea with the amendment is really to codify those existing common law requirements. Um, but, and you can look at the language. I do think it makes um, the requirement a little bit broader by the way it defines prosecution team because it requires anyone on the prosecution team who has the, the these types of evidence, um, the types of evidence that would tend to um, negate the guilt of the defendant or uh, the types of evidence that may undermine the credibility of a witness. Um, if that information is available to anyone on the prosecution team, they are required to turn it over. So in that way, I do think it extends, um, it is a little bit greater of an obligation than what exists in common law. Other questions for either Senator Rahm or Bryn? John Campbell, uh, Executive Director of the State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Good morning. Good morning. John Campbell, for the record, State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Um, I, I have to say I'm a little surprised uh, on a couple of things. Number one, that this topic is on this bill. Um, but, and again, also the timing of it. Uh, this is like, my understanding is third reading. And uh, the whole concept of Brady Giglio would take, we could take a whole morning to discuss it because so many people just misunderstand what the, the obligations are. Um, you know, this bill, I think what it does is it, it conflates the two legal obligations that we have, not just under common law. We have it uh, also as uh, under professional uh, rules of conduct number uh, 3.8, they have a specific rule just for prosecutors uh, that states exactly this about what that we have to disclose information. So there's a professional conduct side. Additionally, and as Senator Benning knows, um, there's also rule um, 16 um, that is the discovery rule. And it tells you exactly what has to be um, disclosed, which is all you know, Brady material. The Brady material is, is material that tends to negate the guilt or exculpatory uh, evidence uh, that would be um, beneficial to the defendant. We have an on ongoing obligation to, uh, to present that, to provide it to the, to the defense. The Giglio um, aspect of this, the Giglio, what's called Giglio letters that everybody uh, has been referring to, that goes to the impeachment side uh, at a trial. So if we know that there's a, an issue, not just with police officers, this goes with all, all witnesses we have. If we know that there is something um, about that witness that uh, would go to their truth uh, or their veracity um, or just to indicate any type of bias, then um, that information uh, is, uh, we send in a letter to the defense counsel uh, and, uh, and advise them of that. This, this um, and, and also, let me just say too, and, I, and all due respect to Senator, or Senator Ron, I don't know what state's attorney she's talking to, but this is a mandatory requirement. This is an obligation that's, that's mandatory under common law, under rule 16, and under professional's conduct. There's no discretion here. We have to disclose this information. If not, we are subject to significant sanctions both by the court and also by the professional conduct board. Um, and I believe, I mean, this is another thing, you probably should check with the professional conduct board to see if anybody's ever brought, um, or how many complaints have ever been brought for under 3.8. So, um, and, and again, the state's attorneys, again, I don't know who you talk, who, who's been taught, spoken to, but 
Uh, they, we, every summer when we do our training, this is one of the major things we do. We do it repeated all the time, especially for the new, for, you know, new individuals coming in that they have these obligations. It's something that in, in criminal procedure in law school, I mean, you, you learn this. It's not, this is nothing that's new. This is nothing that's avant-garde. This is something that is a basic requirement in criminal law. Um, the, my concern with, with, this, with this language, again, it conflates two specific areas that are already dealt with across the board um, and then kind of broadens it. And as such, it, there's gonna be a conflict with what we already have in criminal rules. In fact, what, what concerns me is I believe that the way this is written here, uh, because it does not include the exceptions that are there um, for certain, and you'll understand what exceptions, why they're there. Um, but there are exceptions that would probably require us now to disclose the uh, names and identity of confidential informants. I think it would also uh, question whether we have to deliver work product um, and also um, the victim's names and addresses. These are all uh, exceptions that are set out uh, and in the, the rule, uh, the rule 16, but it's not here. By trying to do this quickly like this, I think you all are making a major mistake that you're gonna end up having unintended consequences across the board and possibly doing more harm for what, what we are trying to do. And that is to have more transparency than, to, uh, than, than you realize. Um, I, again, I wish I had more time, uh, but I just uh, saw this amendment last night uh, I'm more than happy. I know I've, sp I've spoken to, to this, uh, many of the state's attorneys last night who were very concerned um, that they were, and they're also really shocked that this, this was even brought up because of the fact that we do have the continuing obligation and that this is something that uh, they do on a regular basis. Well, whether they're shocked that it's been brought up or not, any senator has a right to walk okay, around I understand. to a bill. I mean, I, you know that. Um, so, uh, and, and whether or not it's germane to the bill is a question that Loomer has to answer right? if somebody questions it. Right? So I, I, I just, uh, it is a, obviously a fairly complex area of, of the law that many of us are not that familiar with, but I, I, I'm not sure we're getting at the prosecutor that's not, I guess it's a question for uh, Senator Rahm or, or a Bryn, is this getting at the prosecutor or the police officer? Because if the prosecutor is already required to give this information, what happens if the police officer is not given? I mean, there's a case, there's, ironically, there's a case in the Bennington uh, court yesterday where they went to the Supreme Court because they believed the police officer got the wrong person. And the identity from the witness had to do with did the person have a beard? Did they have a tattoo or a goatee? And did they have silver caps on their teeth and that sort of thing? And the guy that they got doesn't appear to have that. So there was that question. And I don't think that was the prosecutor. I think it was the police officer who did the investigation. So I, does this go to the police officer or the prosecutor or get at the Oh, well, I think the answer is really both. The obligation is on the prosecution team, which can include an investigative officer who's working on the case. But uh, I think that the idea behind the, at least the Giglio file portion is to, is to um, codify the requirement that the prosecution team turn over any information that might um, indicate that one of their witnesses um, could be impeached on the stand. So I think in that way it goes, it would apply to both. Thank you. That's helpful. Any comment, Senator White? And and would it also apply to witnesses? As John, I mean, not just police officers, but if I'm I'm a witness, it would also apply to me. Yes. Okay. It, it would apply to any witness who the prosecution is using to establish an element of the crime. Okay. Um, any questions for John Campbell? Thank you for being here on short notice, John. Thank you. Uh, Julio Thompson's here representing the Attorney General's office. Yeah. Julio, thank you for being here on short notice. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, 
I'm just trying to get my uh, <clears throat> my video in order. I'm getting it right now. It's, it's, it's been been a, this yeah, we can hear you. We can't oh. see you. It's been a problem this morning. We've had a lot of folks have had technical difficulties. Uh, <clears throat> well, for the record, my name is Julio Thompson, Assistant Attorney General, Director of Civil Rights uh, Unit. Uh, you know, our office, the Attorney General, uh, certainly agrees with Senator Rahm uh, and others that have spoken that the duty to disclose information that could be used to impeach a witness in a, in a prosecution isn't a discretionary duty. It's a constitutional duty that's been around, that's been articulated since uh, the Giglio case in 1972, so almost 50 years now. Um, and um, as I heard, I received a copy of this bill yesterday, and, and as I read in subsection A, and as I heard Ledge Council say today that uh, the point of the bill here is to codify the, you know, the existing duty in statute to, for the purposes of ensuring that there's no mistaking that this is a, a duty and not um, a recommendation. And uh, I think that um, uh, um, from the state's attorney's office, the reference to, to rule 16 of the rules of criminal procedure, which are issued by the Vermont Supreme Court, I, I think is important that uh, section B of that does identify in a way the, the, um, the Giglio rule, um, as well as the exceptions that have been recognized under it, for example, with confidential informants, there's a procedure <clears throat> by which um, under the rules of evidence that the Vermont Supreme Court issued where the court would have its own private hearing where, you know, without jeopardizing the disclosure of, of, of a confidential informant to see whether the information that's to be provided, is, you know, is material um, to, to the evidence of the case. It is an objective standard um, that the prosecutor has to fo follow the rule is that there has to be, you have to disclose if there's a reasonable possibility that um, disclosure of the information could undermine their case. Uh, not a certainty, but also not, um, not a remote possibility either. Um, so to the extent that the rule is art articulating the existing standard, um, I, you know, I think we're supportive of that because I, you know, I, I have not been involved in any discussions about Giglio or anything like that, but if there is this idea that it is something that's a should rather than a shall, then that's something we would certainly want to eliminate. Um, with respect to this issue about the, the scope of the rule and the prosecution team uh, extending to the police, um, I guess I would, I would clarify or expand upon what you've heard from Ledge Council uh, about whether that duty extends to to people who are not just the prosecutors. And that's already existing law. In 1995, there was a, a case called the Kyles case, Kyles v. Whitney, um, saying that information that's known only to the police uh, who are part of the arrest team and part of the investigation is also subject to that disclosure rule. The idea being that <coughs> due process doesn't want to, or the court doesn't want to have a system set up where the prosecution team kind of sticks their head in the sand once they've got the evidence that's fav favorable to their case. And so it indirectly mandates the prosecutor to inquire of the law enforcement agency, you know, to affirmatively look for that information to get it. And then I guess the discretion that is involved here is whether the prosecutor is going to use the evidence. Um, uh, the prosecutor uh, you know, it gets to decide what witnesses they're going to put on, and 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 Giglio really has to do with information that would be used to impeach the credibility of witnesses. So I, I'm not sure. I don't see an expansion of the existing rule here, which I think is which makes subsection A, I think, consistent. It's 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 basically an intent to codify um, the rule. I think that. To avoid confusion, it would be helpful, perhaps, to indicate not only that um, this confirms, you know, the the obligations under the, this case law, um, but also make it sure that it's 
ha have some reference that it's not intended to override the more detailed uh, procedural rules that are set forth in Rule 16, um, both under the federal rules of criminal procedure and under virtually every state's rules of criminal procedure. That's where the finer details about what do you do about, you know, things like attorney work product, um, uh, you know, that privilege material at the federal level, there are exceptions relating to national security uh, exceptions that may come up in federal cases. So unfortunately, Bryn has to leave Julio. So uh, say okay. thank you, Bryn. And, uh, Thanks, Bryn. Um, so I think, I think it would be helpful if, if the committee's gonna go forward with the amendment to ensure that there's some reference, some kind of preservation language um, or savings uh, language with respect to Rule 16.1, because I didn't, I didn't hear today or read in the text any, any intent to undo what the Supreme <coughs> Court um, has done in Rule 16 for for a long time. Um, so I guess that's where I, I would stop. And if there are questions, I can I can answer that. Well, Marley has a question. Um, I thank you. Are there any questions for Julio? Um, I, I'm sorry, I gotta go take care of a dog who's barking like crazy. Uh, Senator Bruce, can you take over for a minute? Sure, do you, do you want uh, Commissioner Sherling next? To, uh, Commissioner Sherling, uh, are you here to comment on the draft? I was, uh, good, after, good morning, Senator. Um, I was here uh, initially to uh, listen in and comment as necessary. Uh, we've only had the bill for uh, an hour and 10 minutes or so. Uh, so a little disadvantaged. Um, uh, just briefly in listening to the, uh, the testimony, a couple things uh, stand out. I, I agree with both uh, what um, Julio and, and John Campbell um, have said, um, I'm a little concerned about moving um, swiftly with something that is so technical. Um, for the committee's background, um, I was a criminal law instructor uh, at the police academy for, I don't know, a, a, a great many years uh, from the mid to late 90s through the mid 2000s. Uh, and I can uh, tell you that embedded in the criminal law curriculum, our discussions of both Brady and Giglio and the mandatory nature of uh, reporting uh, exculpatory evidence in the case of Brady and um, uh, reporting issues of credibility uh, in regards to Giglio. And it's something that we deal with on a, uh, a fairly regular basis uh, annually um, in conversations with prosecutors, ensuring, uh, I think, to a uh, to, for the most part, uh, I think what you uh, see around the state is um, uh, in many cases over reporting um, of Giglio issues in particular to ensure that the prosecutor got uh, the full array of things that may be uh, necessary to disclose under those rules. So uh, that's just a, a, a little bit of cursory background. Um, on the fly on, on short notice. Uh, it, it strikes me in, uh, at least preliminarily in, in listening to the, the, the initial testimony here that one solution to this may be to codify uh, in a more simplified fashion uh, to point to the rules um, of evidence and to point to the uh, Brady and Giglio decisions and as the current draft says, their progeny um, and just state that those things are uh, mandatory for uh, law enforcement organizations to comply with, that it's not just something that uh, applies to prosecutors because you know, by extension, it's, it's kind of meaningless if uh, it applies to prosecutors, but you're not getting reports from law enforcement agencies. Again, I'm not aware of that happening, but um, if you want to address this in statute in the future, there may be a more simplistic way to do that and ensure that uh, all of the complexity that goes with both the rules and the existing case law are preserved um, and not harmed uh, in any way. Um, those are some preliminary thoughts, but again, uh, it is very difficult to digest uh, something this technical uh, with so many potential implications on the existing way that business is, is conducted um, 
on an hour's notice. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Dick, you're muted. Thank you. I, I appreciate that, Commissioner. I'm, I'm feeling like we're a little bit, that this is an issue that deserves more attention. And Senator Rahm, we're, we're willing to introduce a bill on it. I, I think it, it should be addressed. Um, but I don't know if that H145 is the place to do it at this point. But I, I, the credibility, I mean, it goes back things, bills that we have passed in this committee regarding innocence protection, the use of lineups, all of those things are all related to making sure we get the right person and that we've done it correctly. Um, you know, and, uh, Commissioner Sherling is to be commended, I think, for, um, I will say in my district, well, a lot of people are um, upset that a certain trooper has been charged. Um, the fact is it was um, members of the, you know, of the team that was there that, that made the case and rather than the defendant claiming something. Um, the defendant claims he doesn't even remember the situation. Toxicated, but uh, there were, I think, three state police officers there, and, and the, the other two were the ones who felt that the, the officer who struck the defendant had done so in a manner that was in terms of unnecessary or unnecessary use of force. Senator Benning, I know you have to run. I do, and I, I wanted to make a couple comments before I did. Um, Senator Rahm, I, I appreciate this attempt. As a criminal defense attorney, I'm always into making sure my clients are covered in every respect. Um, as I think about the history of my own business, um, I've probably represented over 2,500 criminal defendants through the years. And I would say that probably 95.4% of them have, when walking through a police officer's affidavit, stopped me and said, no, the officer's lying about what that is. And in my own head, trying to think through this bill, I feel like I haven't had enough time to wrap my head around how that would all factor into what's going on here. And just so you know, for practical purposes, um, I, I practice in St. Johnsbury, in Gill Hall, and in um, Newport, and in all three of those cases, maybe not with Vince Luzzi because I haven't, I don't think I've ever received one, but what we'll call a Giglio letter that involves a specific police officer has traditionally been sent by the prosecution, and it is shocking when you get it because the uh, prosecutor is letting you know that they, they have no intention of using this person either as a witness in the specific case or in any future uh, cases going forward. So on the one hand, I'll, I'll compliment the state in taking that responsibility pretty seriously. The only nervousness I have here right now is I haven't thought through the process. If I call the state's attorney and I say, well, my client says police officer so-and-so lied on this occasion about this event, at what point does that information get factored into what you're trying to do here to codify um, something? And I, I really personally feel like as a criminal defense attorney who totally supports your, your bill, um, that I would like to be able to flesh that out in my head before I leap to any conclusions. Um, but just so you know, we hear a lot about what goes on around the United States and how uh, police officers have been uh, kept secret for one thing or another, as we do priests and a whole lot of other things. Uh, but in Vermont, at least in my criminal experience, police officers and prosecutors have been very good about trying to make sure any exculpatory information is provided um, or even a, a potential for that is addressed um, so I, right now, I feel like there's a system that is working. Um, and if you're going to codify something, which I have no problem with, I want to make sure even 
every possible base that I've experienced has been covered. And I don't feel like I've got the ability to think that through between now and when this bill gets read for the third time, which I have to say, I, I have to leave. I may not get back to have it during its third reading. So I don't even have that time to digest this. Um, but um, for the committee, should we go to third reading and something comes up that would be a problem, I would respectfully ask that the bill be passed over so that I can come back and participate in the process uh, before third reading takes place. Will do. Uh, uh, Commissioner Sherling, you have your hand up. Thank you, Senator. And uh, in, in listening to Senator uh, Benning's comments, it, it struck me uh, that I left out a, a, a critical piece of background, which is that uh, in the two agencies that I've been uh, most intimately involved in, in both Burlington and, uh, and with the state police, uh, when an officer is found to have a veracity issue, in other words, they lie in an official account of anything, whether that's an affidavit or something else, that is fatal to their career. So uh, it should be a rare occurrence that Giglio letters um, A, occur, and then B, uh, that there are future cases involving that particular officer because uh, while I can't speak to every agency in Vermont and their practices, for the most part uh, in the agencies that I'm familiar with and the ones that I have worked in, uh, veracity issues are fatal. And we tell people that, uh, in that in those academy classes that I described as well, that um, your word is the most important asset that you've got. Um, if the prosecutor can't believe you, if the court cannot believe you, you are absolutely useless to the criminal justice system. So you must report um, all facts known to you, including those are exculpatory, and your veracity must be maintained throughout your career uh, to a fault. And while that doesn't always happen because we employ humans who are flawed, uh, that is stressed and restressed. Uh, from the time people are in the academy forward. Julio, did you want to comment? Mr. Chair, may I say yeah. one thing be before sure, Senator? Sure, please do. I just want to say before Senator Benning has to go, because as a colleague, I know how stressful it can be if you're the reporter of a bill and you don't know what might happen on third reading. Um, I, I did tell the chair and the vice chair that if it's the will of the committee to keep looking into this issue and getting more information before bringing an issue like this to the floor, then I would absolutely honor that and not push for an amendment today or even next Tuesday um, because that's not necessarily enough time to cover all of your bases. So I just didn't want you to leave feeling like you might have to um, hear this via you know, some other means later today. I appreciate that, Senator. My, my colleagues are, are fairly competent in this area actually. And sometimes they scare me because they know more than I do. Uh, but I, I, I think the issue is certainly a good topic for conversation. Um, I, I would hope that uh, you understand that and that we not try to do something too quickly uh, because it may have unintended consequences. And I haven't even thought those out yet, even though I support this concept. Thank you. Senator White and then Julio. So I was, I was just going to say that um, it seems to me that all of us are um, appreciative of the um, introducing the concept and that um, and when I think about how much time we spent talking about the word feasible um, and how little time we have to do this it, it, um, I personally would appreciate this not being added as an amendment to the bill but being but coming in as its own standalone bill and really digging into it and taking testimony. So I appreciate Senator Rom bringing it forth, but that, that's my sentiment. And um, I know that we're running behind time. So I thought I'd say that so that maybe we um, didn't need to continue yeah. discussing it. Julio, did you wanna comment? Yeah, I, before I, I, I left today, I just wanted to address something that Senator Rom mentioned earlier uh, when she spoke about uh, this idea of a registry. So as I, as I mentioned earlier, under the Kyle's decision, the prosecutor has an affirmative duty to go look for this evidence from uh, the folks, including law enforcement that are part of the investigative team. Uh, some of the issues that were raised in, in, in the newspaper article, and my only source is, is the newspaper article uh, and the attachments that they provided, um, is that, you know, there one county 
I mean, officers move from department to department and there's no, I think at least it was asserted in the article, there's no currently right now, no easy way other than to just pick up a phone and start making calls to find out whether an officer has something in their, uh, in their history that might uh, tend to impeach their credibility, like a sustained finding of dishonesty, for example. Uh, and so uh, I think that uh, irrespective of whether the committee goes for this, this amendment, and I think, as I said, we absolutely support uh, making sure everyone understands that they have to follow uh, the Giglio standard. Um, but that one thing that might facilitate the, or to, or to make sure that the prosecutors are making those disclosures is to make it easier for them to find that information. Uh, because under um, both just to, for confidence in the system and also for the individual accused under Giglio, uh, you don't have to show that the prosecutor intentionally suppressed the information. It's if they, even if it was inadvertent, um, and uh, but it could have undermined the confidence or reasonably un undermined the confidence of the verdict, then uh, it's a violation. And so making it more difficult for, or, or making it less likely that mistakes or oversights would happen is something that I think that we would look forward to working with, with folks on. And like I said, um, we'll do it at, at you know whatever time the committee wants to do, but again, um, it is it is crucial, um, and as, as Senator Rom pointed out, or as well as um, Ledge Council, it's not just the prosecutor's office; it's the team on that, and that extends not only to the investigative officers, but in some of the cases you see reported nationally, forensic officers. Uh, you know, you've had cases in other states where lab technicians have. Uh, been found to engage in, in conduct that's not appropriate. And uh, you can read in the, in the newspapers or in the, in the court reporters about uh, disclosures that aren't made that may have undermined confidence in the physical evidence, not just eyewitness. Right. Massachusetts has had a huge problem with that recently. Uh, yeah, so. There so are a number of cases that have been dismissed or even people who were in jail have been uh, let out because of the falsification of some lab stuff. Senator Ron? Well, I just wanted to say, Mr. Chair, you, you've, you've given me and this issue a great deal of time for the end of session and for the other work you have to do today. Um, I, and I appreciate um, other senators raising that, you know, this, this is important to us building trust and credibility in our sworn law enforcement officers so that all Vermonters can feel safer in their presence and having them in their community. So I do look forward to getting you a bill and doing some of the work we've discussed today um, so that that bill can be considered um, in a more robust way by the committee. And I just, I do appreciate all the time you've given this because it's hard to have a conversation about reasonable standards and, and law, law enforcement conduct without talking about these critical issues of credibility and, um, eyewitness reporting. So really appreciate your time. And I, I will Welcome. not ask the committee for a vote or anything. I would, I think it's the sense of the committee um, that it's an inter, it's a topic that deserves to have uh, full blown hearings. And I would appreciate, um, I, I don't think it can happen this session. I think it, it'd be something that we would certainly put foremost uh, next year in this committee, if what for Alston here. Well, wait a minute. This is the second. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I hope you all are still here, but <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, I got a little confused about which year it is. Um, so I, I would think this would be a topic um, of importance, but I also think the topic of um, that Senator White has worked so hard on in terms of the decertification of officers and having information when officers go from one district to one police department or agency to another um, is foremost. And I went through that with teachers um, who, and obviously in the Catholic Church, we have the same problem with people who go from one place to another to continue to do things. That are not Thank you very much, Senator Ron. Appreciate you being here. Thank you. Have and Julio and John Campbell and Commissioner Sherling and uh, others, thank you for being here on short notice. Really appreciate it.
Thank you, Mr. Chair.